Welcome everyone. It's great to have you here for a webinar on the EU deforestation regulation in the coffee world. The EUDR is vital as it seeks to ensure that products entering the EU market do not fuel deforestation or degrade forests. Its important lies in promoting responsible trade practices that contribute to combating climate change. This webinar follows our last session, which was about EUDR in the coffee in the cocoa sector. Today is all about the coffee, all about coffee and uh, how we can all work with the EUDR. We're coming together from all corners of the globe, which is really exciting. Our last talk on COCO had people from over 65 countries. For this webinar, um, we, we have subscriptions of from over 73 countries. The UEDR is really a big deal for many actors working in the coffee sector. Today, you will hear from experts in the sector. They will share their tips and what they have learned so you can benefit from it. My name is Chela de Boer. I lead the research team for coffee and cocoa at CBI, and I will be guiding us through the, today's webinar. Let's dive in and learn how you can get uh, how you can prepare better for the UDR. But first, let's get you, give you a better idea of the content of today's webinar. Now, the main goals of today are um, first to get a very short summary of the UDR. Second, to be informed on how other companies prepared for the UDR and to get loads of examples. Third, to get practical tips and tools and which you can use and how to face challenges. And four, to get answers on your personal questions relating to UDR. In addition, we will shortly touch upon some breaking news issued, by, issued around the UDR by the European Commission just yesterday. Now, before we get into that interesting content, uh, let's first uh, explain something about GoToWebinar, which is the tool that we use for this session. Now, the tool is really simple and you only have a few elements in your menu. First of all, you need to know that we cannot hear or see you. So you can wave at us, but we won't notice. However, you do have the option to post questions in the field under questions. And I really invite you to do so. We don't have time to answer all of your questions, but we will try to answer as many questions as possible during this webinar. Also, on the background, the team of CBI members is available to answer some of your questions. So please add your questions in the question pane. Now, as I mentioned before, I'm not here alone. Most content will be shared by our panel of experts. Ruben, Mathieu, Giuseppe, Alex, Pedro, please turn on your cameras and please introduce yourself. Great to have you here. Ruben, can you start, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Ruben Bergsma. I'm uh, on the um, CBI research team with Chaling. Thanks, Mathieu. Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Mathieu Lamol. I'm a senior advisor at the International Trade Center in Geneva. Very pleased to be with you today. Thank you. Welcome, Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, super happy to be back again. Uh, my name is Alex Schumann. I am Impact Business Executive at The Coffee Quest. We are a green specialty coffee importer based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Yes, you have helped us before, so it's great to have you back. Um, as you said. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Cipriani, and I'm the business development lead at the Progressive Foundation with a special focus on Baco which is uh, our traceability platform. And on this webinar, I'm going to represent one of our cooperatives, which is a Colombian organization called Global Cafes. I'll tell you more about it later on. OK, thank you very much, uh, as you said. Uh, now, Hans, let's uh, continue. Could you please introduce yourself as well as um, uh, CBI, who's, which is hosting the session? Yes, thank you, Charlin. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Perfect. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Depending on where you're watching us. Your camera on, please. Yes, it should be on yes. now. Yeah, we can see you. Ah, oh, perfect. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Depending where you're watching us from, um, welcome to the webinar on tips to meet EU. DR requirements for the coffee sector um, organized by CBI. 
I am Hans Mensa. I am the market intelligence program manager for the coffee sector at CVI. For those who are new here, uh, CVI stands for the Center for the Promotion of Imports from Developing Countries. So we are a government agency um, established in 1971 by the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, operating as part of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. So CBI currently operates in over 25 countries, primarily in Africa and Southeast Asia, across 14 different sectors. We focus predominantly on the agricultural uh, sector, but we also uh, work in service industries such as tourism and IT outsourcing. So our mission uh, is uh, twofold. Uh, one is to support the transition towards sustainable and uh, inclusive economies. And the second is to strengthen the social, economic and environmental sustainability of SMEs in developing countries uh, by connecting them to the European market and also regional uh, markets. So how do we do this um, or how do we achieve this? We uh, employ a dual approach. Um, we um, first implement projects in our focus countries, which are the 25 countries which I just mentioned, and uh, to prepare SMEs for a successful entry uh, into the European market. So we have ex uh, experts and export coaches on the ground who provide coachings and trainings. And in these projects, we try to promote and create decent jobs, uh, pay attention to uh, women and youth entrepreneurship and employment, and also to stimulate um, production and trade. Our starting point is always with the SMEs, whereby we offer uh, practical solutions to eliminate any bottlenecks in the export value uh, chain. Um, so for instance, currently we have an ongoing project in um, Uganda for the coffee uh, sector, uh, whereby we assist farmers in producing climate smart coffee uh, that complies with the EU DR requirements. Um, Charlie, can you move to the second slide, please? Yes, thank you. Uh, second, we provide comprehensive market information uh, about the European market, which I oversee for the coffee sector. Um, so annually, we publish uh, over 300 studies, uh, studies on our website, including uh, market analysis, the trends and developments within the sector, also tips for exporting um, um, your products. Uh, we have a study called Tips for Fine European Buyers. We also provide country fact sheets and also product fact sheets such as organic and certified coffee. And also we recently published a new study on how to become EDR compliant in the coffee sector, which at the end of this webinar, I will show you, uh, I'll demonstrate uh, how to navigate this on, on, on our website uh, to access these uh, yeah, studies. So um, uh, stay tuned. And um, it's important to note as well that these information are all free of charge on our website. So you can also download them uh, on, uh, on your PC or on your phone. Um, now let's turn back to uh, the main topic of today, which is about EUDR. Um, and this regulation is supposed to significantly uh, impact the coffee exporters targeting the EU market. And um, in today's webinar, we'll dive deeper into this requirement and provide practical tips for you to export uh, to the European market. So with this being said, I would like to hand over uh, back to Charlie. Thank you Thank very you. much, Hans. Thank you. Um, now, uh, to follow up, I would like to, uh, well, follow up with some breaking news. Uh, just yesterday, the European Commission announced that they proposed 12 months of extra phasing in time. Mathieu, um, this morning we had a short discussion, and uh, uh, interesting discussion about this press release and what it actually means for coffee exporters and other stakeholders involved in the sector. Can you please share your thoughts around this? Absolutely, and thank you so much, uh, Jay Ling. Indeed, it's, a, it's an important uh, step forward, this announcement that was made yesterday by the European Commission. Um, it is likely to provide some relief, especially for small businesses in developing countries. And we know in the coffee sector, uh, most of the farmers are very small holders with very small uh, plots of land. So this additional time would be some uh, relief. Um, they currently face a number of challenges to comply with EUDR, and we will we will learn into that in the next uh, sessions for sure. 
On our side at the ITC, we are very much understanding the concerns from uh, businesses, particularly in the poorest regions, when it comes to really having access to the tools, to the finance, the capacity to comply with the EUDR. Now, this proposal of the EU uh, to actually give an extra 12 months to phase in uh, the implementation of EUDR uh, needs to be understood carefully because, of course, that still um, comprises a number of next steps that we need to keep in mind. Number one, uh, this proposal will have to be discussed at the European Parliament. It will be discussed and potentially even amended. But it's the proposal is there, it is on the table, but the EU Parliament, as a practical next step, will have to discuss it and potentially come with amendments. And then comes the Council. The EU Council will then review the proposal for approval. The following third step, after Parliament and Council reviews, there must be a consensus, a consensus by both the Parliament and the Council that must agree to adopt this proposal of extra 12 months. After that, there would be a formal adoption. And once agreed, this extension will be officially adopted. And then that means the regulation enters into this next phase with extended deadlines for compliance. So again, let's, let's make sure that EUDR is well understood by all the stakeholders. Um, if there is 12 months extra, this time will be used to better prepare businesses through Handbooks, you heard about the studies, the CBI, all the agencies that are working very hard to help smallholders navigate the regulation. And the coffee sector desperately needs support. So this is where we stand today. Thank you again. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mathieu. So it seems to really pivotal to keep up to date on developments about around the UDR, but uh, well, delay or no delay, it we also remains paramount to prepare well for EUDR, and that is really what this webinar is about. Um, so let's start start talking about uh, about the content of the EUDR. But um, before we do that, let's. I'm very curious uh, where you stand in preparing for EUDR. Um, so you will have this question uh, in your screen right now. And please select your answer. What is your knowledge of the UDR? Is that limited? Is that basic or extensive? Please click the answer you prefer best. I see many answers coming in, so it's great you're participating. I give you a few more seconds. Just select your answer you prefer best. And I'm closing the poll now. Okay, and there it is. Um, it seems that a uh, little over half says uh, I have basic knowledge. So uh, uh, also a lot of people with limited knowledge and uh, just a few with extensive knowledge. Um, well, that is the perfect bridge for uh, to go to uh, to Ruben. Uh, Ruben, can you please uh, uh, share yourself and explain us a bit about uh, the basics of the of the UDR? You're still muted, uh, Ruben. Sorry, doing multiple things at once. I pulled up the PowerPoint as well. Does that work? Yeah, but not the proper slide. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Great. So I wanted to give you a brief overview of the EUDR and the requirements. Um, Chelling promised earlier that we would keep this very short, but I think it's important to um, to go into it a little bit, especially as we just saw in the poll that um, some of you still have um, a basic knowledge. So I think it would be good to uh, to explain the basics of the EUDR. Uh, Mathieu already talked about the proposal. Uh, made by the European Commission yesterday. They also published an updated uh, FAQ and a guidance document. And we've added these to the handouts and go to webinars. So you can download them in the control panel by going to uh, the handouts. Um, those will also answer a lot of the questions that you might have. Um, okay, so what is the EUDR? The goal of the EUDR has already been mentioned several times. The EUDR, the regulation, was demanded by the EU markets and consumers, and by many companies as well. The EUDR covers several products, 
uh, in this webinar, we will only talk about coffee. What it means is that coffee can only enter the EU markets if it was produced legally and on land that is deforestation free. This means that no deforestation took place after the cutoff dates of December 31st, uh, 2020. Coffee must also be traceable to prove that it came from deforestation free and legal sources. The UDR applies to companies in the EU. Uh, the text of the EUDR calls these operators and traders. So these operators and traders have the due diligence obligations of the EUDR. The due diligence statement uh, is checked by the competent authority in the country. And those are uh, also, you can also find those on the EU DR websites. So who does the, uh, who does the EUDR apply to? It's the operators and the traders that need to comply with the EUDR. Um, according to this definition, an operator is any natural or legal person who places the coffee on the markets. Very simply speaking, this is the, the point when the coffee enters the EU. And the trader is any person in the supply chain other than the operator who makes the coffee available on the markets. Um, this is explained in a lot more detail in the FAQ that I mentioned. So for the, the details, I recommend uh, going there. But the focus of this webinar is on coffee exporters, so those exporting to the EU. These are not traders or operators according to the EUDR definition. So they're not the ones that need to prove compliance. However, for exporters, it's important for you to know what your customers will want. So that's why we'll go through these requirements. So what are the requirements for operators and traders? Here you see the information that your buyers will need for compliance. This includes information about the product, the quantity, the origin, and the suppliers and the buyers. It also includes geolocations of the plots and proof that the product is deforestation free and legal. For geolocations, that means GPS points for plots smaller than four hectares and polygons for plots larger than four hectares. And based on this information, they have to do a risk assessment. This is an in investigation into the supply chain. This investigation takes into account the assigned risk of the producing country. This risk level will be defined by the EU, but the country risk levels have not been set yet. There's more about this in the guidance as well. They have to also establish the related risks, and this includes human rights risks, so not just environmental risks. If there is no or only a negligible risk, then this step is enough. But if there's a risk, then the operators and traders have to do risk mitigation. So for example, this could be asking for extra information or carrying out independent surveys or audits. Uh, traders and operators have to maintain a due diligence system. This has to be supported by policies, controls and procedures. Companies also have to report on these systems. And all of this information must be made available to the competent authorities if they request it. The aim of all of this is to achieve no or a negligible risk. That all applies to your buyers in the EU. So what does this, all this mean for producers and for exporters? So as a producer or exporter, you are not responsible for EUDR compliance, but your buyers in the EU will ask you for this information. So as a producer or exporter, you can help the importer by providing accurate data and information that the importer can use. They need this information to prove that the coffee is EUDR compliant and can be placed on the EU markets. Many importers will still do their own checks on the data as well. They might ask for more proof or assurance. And this is because they are the ones that are responsible for the correctness of the information. So they want to be sure that it is correct. For exporters, it's important that you can also give them this assurance. And there's a lot of support available to help you with this. So the first step is to make sure that you understand the UDR. So it's important to invest in your own knowledge and the knowledge and um, capacity of your own organization first. That way you're not overly reliant on external uh, services for the UDR. But there are a lot of tools available to help you with this. So the EU has the Team Europe Initiative on Deforestation Free Value Chains. Uh, this initiative has several activities and projects, and they focus on uh, smallholders and low-income countries. It's also possible to record a GPS point or create a polygon map with your smartphone, 
or Global Navigation Satellite System device. And the EU Agency for the Space Program is also developing a free tool. Certification could help here too. Uh, it's important to note that certification schemes cannot replace the due diligence obligations of companies, but they can support their due diligence. And then there are many service providers that can help you prepare for the EUDR as well. Some examples are Satelligence, SourceMap, Nadar, and Beko, who is also part of this webinar today. And uh, we describe this um, in a lot more detail. I give more examples in the CBI study that Hans will show you later. Many service providers also offer a free version of their tools, which is usually a very basic version. I don't know if you can still see my screen. It's, um, it's changed the way it looks, but I will uh, continue. Um, so many offer also a basic free version of the tool. So that might be worth looking into as well. And lastly, uh, long-term relationships and trust will also still help a lot. So the, the, uh, the trust that you have with your buyers. If you have a trusting relationship with your buyers, then it will also give them more confidence that they can rely on the information that you can provide. So doing all this can help you uh, as an exp exporter also become more attractive in the EU market because you are able to provide the information that the buyers need in order to prove that they are compliant with the EUDR. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, back to you, Chelling. Thank you very much, uh, Ruben. Uh, for that, that could clear overview as well, some uh, practical tips already. Uh, so this webinar is about guidelines, tips and tools that exporters can use when exporting coffee to the EU, uh, um, uh, when exporting coffee. And before we go to the companies and their experience, I would like to invite Mathieu to tell a bit more about this very practical handbook that you developed. Um, Mathieu, uh, can you please tell a bit more about, uh, about the handbook? Yes, uh, thank you so much again, uh, Chailing. Um, we discussed about studies, we discussed about capacity building for uh, companies exporting coffee, importing as well, actually, because in the EU themselves, companies are wondering a little bit how to deal with the EUDR. So it's really a supply chain challenge. And in this case, at the ITC, we have developed a series of handbooks. Um, the web link is there. Um, there would be also a possibility to share the, the link in the chat. But this is a series of practical handbooks to explain in very clear business scenarios what happens when you are producing a product that falls within the scope of the, of the EUDR. Um, these handbooks are actually a collaborative approach between multiple agencies. It's not just ITC, actually CBI experts have also contributed to these handbooks. Uh, other agencies in the UN, FAO, UNDP are also contributing some examples and business scenarios. You can, for instance, uh, when you look at them, understand if the coffee, imagine, is grown in Uganda and then is exported to Belgium, but part of it goes directly to Switzerland, another part goes to the UK, and then from the Switzerland, the Swiss are making capsules of the coffee and the capsules go back to French market. So what happens? Who needs to do the due diligence? Who needs to run the risk analysis or risk mitigation? Who needs to collect the data? And then what are the best practices to collect information and contribute to due diligence obligations of those traders and operators that are in the EU market? Well, those answers would be found in the handbooks. This is continuously updated by the ITC, the team, and all the contributors. They are global public goods. They are also free of charge on the, on the website. I wanna thank again here CBI for an excellent collaboration on this and stay tuned because there will be new additions. Uh, we just published yesterday a step-by-step -step operational guidance for companies. So you can go online and download as well these resource materials. And again, this is, this is teamwork and uh, more than happy to get some questions and feedback and contributions from others. Back to you and again, thank you for having me uh, during this webinar, it's fascinating. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much for your contribution, uh, Mathieu. Uh, now, in the meantime, if you, our audience, uh, uh, do have questions, please add those to the question pane. So at the end of this webinar, we will have some time to answer the personal questions that apply to your personal situation or your company. Uh, we, our experts, will take some time to answer uh, part of those questions. Uh, so if you do have questions, please write those down in the question pane. Now let's move on to our next topic, which is uh, 
about the importers and exporters that we invited to talk about how they have implemented EUDR and which challenges they face, what tools they use and what this could mean for, for you as coffee exporters. Now, Alex, to start with you, can you tell about how you have implemented EUDR, which tools that you use and how this will affect uh, the exporters that you work with? And let me give you a second. So. Uh, um, here's your first slide. In the meantime, I give you the presenter rights, so, but uh, I'm very curious. Yeah. Um, but that's, yeah. Have you handed me presenter rights? Sorry. No, not yet. I'm, I'm working on it. Okay. Uh, can, can <laughs> that's start okay. Can you show your, your first slide, actually, uh, now. Okay, let's gather so I can also start talk. Ah, there we go. Um, lovely. Okay. Are you guys seeing my presentation? Yeah, we are. Brilliant. Nice. Okay. Um, right. So yes, what have we as uh, imports been doing to prepare? So as, oh, that was not meant to happen. Sorry, my screen just slipped back. There we go. Um, as uh, you guys all know, there was a lot of confusion and uncertainty for a long time around what exactly was required um, from imports and exporters. So the main thing we've been doing since the EUDR has been announced is just kind of staying informed with whatever is available with online webinars, um, EUDR-focused events, networking events, to stay in the loop. Uh, some have kind of just been informative, others have actually helped us create concrete and actionable steps that we can take. Um, and three of those I want to talk about today in particular. One of those is how we've developed our own internal ESG policies to ensure compliance. Then another one is how uh, participating... One moment, I think there's some background noise. One moment. All right, guys, that was a gush in the background. Um, uh, so exactly participating in pilot programs for uh, geodata collection, how they've helped us. And lastly, how our various networks and communities, uh, the coffee community has helped us stay on top of things. So firstly, uh, I want to be talking about uh, our internal ESG policies. So according to the EUDR, it's the import's responsibility, right, to demand the information, but the exporters should be the ones to provide it. So for us in a healthy and collaborative supply chain, we see it as our responsibility to ensure that our producers are prepared in the best way that they can to provide the necessary information when we need it. Uh, we already base our whole business operations at the Coffee Coast around three core values, transparency, collaboration, and quality. And the first two in particular really come into play here. So uh, this past year, uh, with increase in talk around transparency and legislation, um, especially in need of transparent and trusting relationships, we've recognized that although we're already operating, operating through these values of transparency and collaboration, we need to find a way to make it more formal and clear Find a clear way of formulating this to in our expectations, formulating our expectations to our partners. Sorry, a lot of big words in that one. Um, so one of the ways in which we've done that is through the publication of our supplier code of conduct. Um, just to quickly explain, the supplier code of conduct is one part of a social action plan, which is a step-by-step -step roadmap that the Coffee Quest has taken to ensure its compliance with our SDG and ESG values. Um, so we started out last year with the publication of our first impact report. We published, published a wage in, and income report. Then this year we published our CSR report, our second impact report, uh, carbon compensation plan, and the supply code of conduct fits into this. Um, there we go. Um, so uh, uh, in our supply code of conduct, it's just a way of uh, clearly outlining uh, the various sustainability and ethics standards that the Coffee Quest operates by and which we expect our exporting partners to operate by 
as well. And I've just quickly uh, taken an excerpt to here. I'm going to show you the non deforestation part. So um, this was published or written back before we had a clear outline of what was needed, um, just to ensure the kind of a, the foundations of what we expect of our um, partners. Um, as you can see here, we mentioned how uh, our suppliers must commit to a zero tolerance policy for deforestation um, and how they should invest in the reforestation of high risk areas and how they're expected uh, to willingly cooperate and give us information that we need for the EUDR. Um, I want to highlight that uh, it's really the um, the word use here. That's why I've highlighted them in white. That it's a it's a must that our partners do commit to zero tolerance policy for deforestation. Um, we understand it's our job to see whether they're compliant or not, but they must be uh, willing to commit to that same goal as as we are. Uh, this code is then uh, sent out to all our exporting partners. Um, and uh, we will make a, a requirement that it is signed by exporting partners in order for us to be able to work together further, along with a more EUDR focused spreadsheet, which we've been able to add later now that we know more, um, which I will talk about in a moment. So uh, that brings us on to the second way that uh, we've been preparing for the EUDR, and that's by participating in pilot programs for uh, data collection and geomapping. Um, we signed with the trial for a program called Meridia, um, but there's really there's so many out there offering a range of different services. Uh, we've got Baker on this call with us today, so also a great opportunity to, to ask some questions, and I'm sure you have. Um, we chose to work with Meridia because they approached uh, TMO, which is our Colombian exporting sister company. So, Coffee Coast Europe is the importing side. We also have an exporting side, Colombia, um, and one in Brazil as well. Um, and they were approached because uh, Coffee Coast Colombia is part of Rabobank's Rural Fund, and therefore, through that connection, they were recommended to this program. Um, and the program's design is targeted at uh, helping exporters and producers in origin prepare for the EUDR. So it was actually targeted at the, the exporting partner of our company. Um, yeah, like I said, there's really a bunch of different programs out there. They offer different services operating in different areas. I suggest that you just take your time to look around um, and also, yeah, use this opportunity to ask for maybe um, as organizations here for some advice. Most of the programs out there that I've come across offer free Q&A or introduction sessions just to start out. Um, and also, like Matthew mentioned before, there are so many free available resources as well so have a look they are out there and otherwise there's people like us there to help guide you in the right direction so just quickly back to Meridia um, it's a collaboration between Rabobank's Rural Fund and uh, Meridia which is a private company um, they uh, focus on they provide tools and support uh, technical and knowledge for exporters to become ready for the EUDR um, the tool will help verify the quality of the data that is uploaded um, and see if it's compliant for the EU tracer system. Um, the nice thing with this one is, is that it's adapted to a bunch of different levels of maturity and scale. And as we're still quite small as an importer, um, it's been really helpful to kind of scale down to, to our level of need. Um, so we've, uh, as I said, we've enrolled in the technical assistance program for Meridia. Uh, we got this through our long-term partnership with Rabobank's Rural Fund. Um, and in the technical assistance program, there's a bunch of different advantages, but we get to do stuff like uh, we're trained on how to submit the farm geodata, um, how to read the risk scores and data insights. Uh, we get to access tried and tested resolutions to problems that come up and challenges. Uh, they include the identification and remedi remediation of uh, data issues and gaps, which is helpful because it means while you're uploading the data, you can already attack the problem or communicate to, we can communicate to your exporters, hey, 90% of the data is really good, we just need to, this little bit to be touched up, or this data point um, is coming across unreliable, can you please edit that? 
Uh, they also offer bi-monthly webinars on key EUDR topics, which is great because it makes sure that the responsibility to stay on top of things is kind of being supported from somewhere else as well. Um, and they also help us gain maturity just in farm mapping and data management as a whole. A really great thing of these pilot projects is that they are in many cases still developing the details, which means that they're responsive to feedback. And this is why webinars like these are so important because it's a chance for uh, the people who really need it, the exporters, the producers, to see what's being expected and what the programs are like. And then we can take your feedback or you can feedback directly to programs like this and say, hey, this doesn't work. You know, we need it differently. So to really keep that feedback mechanism open um, is so important. And that's also why we like this program because they're still willing to, uh, to adapt that. So just quickly, how uh, programs like these have influenced us tangibly as exporters. Um, they've been really instrumental in helping us get a clear idea of what exact data geomapping software requires to ensure compliance and therefore what data we need to be asking for, for our, um, from our exporters. Uh, so just to show this, here you see uh, some screenshots from our existing producer data system for Colombia. So on the left you can see for each producer we have the name, we have the, um, the, the region, uh, they have an ID number, and then we also have the details on the farm, how large it is, uh, where it's based. Um, and then we also keep track of every single purchase that we make from that farmer. We track it. Each uh, lot has its own lot number um, with details about the coffee, how much we paid for it, and the date that we paid it for. Um, and then those individual lots are linked to the producer profile. This was already happening before the EUDR EU came into place. We already had this traceability system in place. Then with the addition of EUDR, we've been able to add this little section down here, which uh, if you think of the mass of data collected already, isn't a huge amount of additional points. We include the mandatory fields from uh, as dictated by the EUDR, so the unique farm plot, the geo coordinates, um, and the type of format that these coordinates or the polygons need to be uh, recorded in, um, as well as the recommended details based off our conversations with programs like Meridia or other feedback from yeah whoever we've been talking to in the system, stuff like the mapping date, um, the farmer name, having a farmer ID, all of these we've included. But actually in having this strong traceable uh, yeah, traceability system in place already with all of our coffee, it has been quite easy for us to add this. And we now have a very clear idea of what we need to ask from our uh, exporting partners or producing partners. Um, obviously with Colombia, we have an advantage because it's our sister company. So we work closely with them already. For our other exporting partners, we will be making a spreadsheet uh, with these key points in them. Um, and asking them to send them out as part of our coffee sourcing process. So when we send out the supply code of conduct to be signed, and we'll also be sending out this. Every time we start a new season, we'll also be sending out the spreadsheet just to gather the information so we can run it through our system easily um, and ensure compliance. Then, ooh, I, I think probably most of these, uh, oh yeah, I just want a little space for some open, uh, questions that were still outstanding. Um, the main one I think I want to quickly touch on is um, that the question we get asked a lot as exporters is if there's going to be available help or funding for the data collection and for the data, the need to, to comply. Um, and then I'm just going to echo what um, Ruben said before, that there really is so much out there um, in terms of like free version, uh, basic versions of those uh, paid tools. Global Forest Watch has um, a uh, public uh, platform. Um, usually the paid versions are more accurate or slightly better, but um, have a look. There are a lot of resources out there, Rabba Rural Fund, government organizations. Um, so yes, there are some resources out there. Um, I think I'll skip this on time. Then the last one I want to talk about is our networks and uh, communities, coffee community. So we have been part of uh, the Future Proof Coffee Collective, which is run by MVO Nederland. 
uh, MBO is a non-governmental organization that uh, to really simplify things down to help businesses transition to a sustainable economy. Um, we joined uh, MBO in 2019 with the Future Proof Coffee Collective where they had a project in Colombia and since then we've uh, worked with them in other projects as well including in 2022 we searched one uh, in Uganda also to make coffee more future proof as the name suggests and in being part of this network we've been able to access a um, much wider network of uh, coffee community to keep it really uh, vague so the way that MVO help businesses transition to more sustainable businesses is in three key, key means. Uh, they focus on building networks for like-minded businesses, um, everything from SMEs to larger corporations. Uh, they promote projects around researching and development innovations and collaborating with and combining private and public sector under one cause. And uh, lastly, and this really is the main one, is that uh, they focus on uh, voting in political spheres to ensure that all voices, regardless how small or insignificant, uh, can be heard. And this is really the main reason that I want to mention them today, is that they've been really an invaluable resource in the discussion around the EUDR. Um, besides organizing their own regular stakeholder meetings and networking events between businesses impacted by the regulation, they've also sent frequent updates on external events and information sources around the regulation. Webinars like these will be in there. Um, and last February, MVO had the opportunity to meet with the EU Ministry um, to discuss challenges around the EUDR and they contacted the whole Future Proof Network, including the tiny, tiny actors. And for us, as a small business, it is so crucial that we have access to these types of networks to ensure that the individuals that formulate our regulations and policies are aware of the challenges and concerns faced by our size businesses, as well as the big corporate giants. And that is appropriate for importers as well as for exporters um on that note actually also i want to thank cbi for um giving space to to the little importers like us um yeah and that's that's it well thanks a lot uh, alex it seems uh, it's very impressive and i'm very pleased to hear that coffee quest has already prepared a lot for the upcoming udr uh, now i wonder where you our attendees uh, are in preparing um, so please submit your answer. Did you prepare for the EUDR? Did you didn't start yet? Perhaps you started preparing for EUDR. Perhaps you are almost ready for EUDR, or perhaps you are completely ready for the EUDR. So please submit the answer you uh, seems fit best, and we will provide the uh, the outcome of the poll in a few seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll in a few seconds. Now, I'm not sure if you can see what we intend to uh, show, but it seems that about 35% didn't start yet, 50% uh, started preparing for UDR. 11% is almost ready and 3% is uh, completely ready. Um, now let me show my screen and um, get to, uh, to uh, the next speaker, which is uh, Pedro from uh, Caravela. Um, now, and one interesting thing is that Caravela is both an importer and an exporter. Uh, I know that this is, this is not uncommon in the coffee sector, but I can imagine that this gives some advantage when implementing the UDR, which is affects the full supply chain. Uh, Pedro, um, uh, you were still uh, busy with other obligations at the start, so we couldn't introduce yourself uh, yet. So could you please introduce yourself and, uh, well, explain us something about how you prepared for UDR? Yes, sir, of course. Do you hear me well? Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry about the lateness. I was 
discussing UDR here as well. Um, uh, my name is happy to uh, to have you on board. My, my name is Pedro Manga. I'm the prosperity leader for Caravela Coffee, which is, as Stalin said, an, an importer exporter uh, that is based in Latin America. Um, I don't know if you have heard, and, and we can go to the next slide, uh, Jelly. Um, I don't know if you have heard about Caravela. Um, we we are especially coffee focused. Um, we, as Stalin said, we import and export. Uh, so we are the only exporters of our importing operation. Um, I'm, I don't know if you're seeing the slides. I'm, I'm not seeing them. I think that they are possible, that they're, they're visible, uh, Pedro. Okay, because I, I cannot see them, sorry. Um, let me check. You are sharing, aren't you? No, sorry, Pedro. We have some issues here. Um, uh, I tried to share the slides, but it's not completely working. Um, there you go. They, yeah, there you are. I, I see them now. Thank you very much. Yeah. If we, if we go ahead with the with the with the slides, Jenny, please. Perfect. So so as 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 I was saying, um, this is kind of the the length of of the supply chain of Caravela. We we work directly with coffee producers. We do not uh, we tend not to work with cooperatives or 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 aggregations of producers. We we go farm to farm to source the coffee. We we sell to directly to roasters as we are importers as well. So our approach and the length of our supply chain is key for how we have prepared for the UDR and how much it has cost us to be ready to, to, to ensure UDR compliant coffee. So we were focused on quality, traceability, but we also have these boots on the ground, which is called our coffee, coffee producer education program, which is basically a technical assistance program that allows us to better understand the community we are sourcing from. We can, we can go ahead. So usually in, in, in the business of, or in the supply chain of coffee is what it is under that red line. There is the coffee producer, then there is somebody or, or, or a lot of players buying parchment, then there is somebody milling and processing that coffee you export it and then you sell it to a coffee roaster. But the UDR is, is entitling us to do different stuff, which are above the red line. Uh, we're going to go through those ones in, in particular, but it's basically we have to first identify our supply chain, basically understand our old supply chain and start to map the new supply chain. Uh, we, we need to start to work on mitigation and remediation strategies. Uh, make a risk assessment of what we have measured but the risk assessment is not, is not the only thing as Matthew was explaining we each exporter or importer determine the risks uh, that are associated to to that coffee and then a due diligence must be presented before the importing uh, at the end and, and it is something that is not widely talked but the UDR regulations state that there must be a communication and reporting of those operators as, as uh, Matthew was saying, um, the operators is the one that make available coffee in Europe and there must be not only communication but uh, reporting on that on that matter. So if we go one by one um, on, on how Caravela has done so, as as Alex was was explaining for the coffee quest, we, we have kind of the same approach and, and and traceability is not and our systems were not built for UDR they were built before UDR um, but even though we have to better understand all, all suppliers and start mapping according to UDR uh, regulations the new suppliers that enter uh, or, or caramela supply chain so where, where's the coffee come from uh, where's the coffee going to uh, know your producer partner and, and, and collecting that information from them. That, as, 
as Alex was explaining. There are different ways we use similar systems or inbound system to collect that data that is a basic requirement, plus many other data that we use to, to uh, back up our risk assessment. So that's the first point, identify your supply chain. Then the, the next point, um, which is the next slide, uh, it's mapping the plots. Uh, Ruben's already stated, it's, it's the regulation states small farms that is less than four hectares just need a longitude latitude point. Then if you have a plot or farm that is larger than four hectares, then you need six of those points uh, in the perimeter of the farm that is known as a polygon. Um, and then you georeferentiate them uh, in, in any GIS system for you to understand where your farms are geographically. That's the first, that's the first kind of up step. Once you have mapped your copy production plots or your, your supply, then you start doing your deforest, your risk assessment. And risk assessment uh, is mainly focused on deforestation assessments, but this deforestation assessment is just half of what, what an operator has to ensure of compliance for the regulation. So there is the deforestation, and and if we go forward there, telling with the clicks, um, there are, uh, as Alex was saying, there are multiple platforms that that could do so. They are mainly divided into different systems, which are open source maps. Um, if you help me there with the with the clicks, there are open source maps and machine learning algorithms, and and which are the differences between those? You, you can go ahead, don't worry. Um, and those are up, up to there. Those are the differences that you would like to see or how those different systems are uh, differentiated. So open source maps are, are these uh, layers of mapping that are available through the satellites that are around the earth. Basically, there are some from the US and there are some from the European Space Agency and, and everybody has access to those maps. Uh, as Alex also said, their accuracy is lower than some uh, paid services, but you can enter Global Forest Watch. There is other suppliers in the UK like um, Trading Space, and there are many, many suppliers that have offered or offered these uh, open source maps. On the other side, there are machine learning algorithm, algorithms, and these are uh, more specific layers that are built to analyze these farming systems. And, and there are also other service providers. There are tons of them, but basically the difference is the definition of deforestation. One, the machine learning and the, is, is different from, from the open source maps on, on how they are assessed. Um, the precision needed. So from open source maps, you usually get precisions of 10 by 10, uh, up to seven by seven meters on, on each pixel. But then in machine learning algorithms, you can go down up to half a meter, uh, uh, half a meter precision, uh, like the Emberitas system has. Then obviously uh, Emberitas, which has the highest resolution, has a higher cost than those that are obviously free, like open source maps. And these are open source and they are free because they have been developed by the um, EU parliament and, and the, the uh, European Union by investing in collaboration with different universities, different service providers for more than 20 years in generating these maps. Um, there are also differences in how they're able to uh, analyze false positives. And that means everything that has to do from hurricanes, from uh, burnouts, for uh, uh, natural fires or agroforestry, even renovation systems that are truly common in, in coffee are mostly not assessed by open source maps and, and it might be needed a machine learning algorithm to get to understand uh, what is coffee and if the pixel is coffee, sugar or a forest and that's usually done by machine learning algorithms and then the scope of the analysis also. So these algorithms need ground truth data. Um, they need somebody at the ground level to say, yes, this is coffee, yes, this is sugar cane, and that depends on the expertise of the service provider. Obviously, they also charge for that, so you have some service providers that are just popping up 
and, and they have a lot of experience. The people in the new uh, companies or, or services providers, they have a lot of experience in GIS, but the company does not have expertise in coffee, cocoa, or, or, or the crops. There are some other service providers that have been in the game for a while doing these geo referencing analysis, and they have more expertise, so they have more robust algorithms that have been trained with multiple images year by year in different countries with coffee systems. So those are the kind of things you should be looking for, depending on where you are in, in, in your process. If you are in that part of the 35%, not they started, 50% started, this is kind of the things that you should be looking for, depending on the scope you have. We have we have tried both of those. If you help me there, jumping with the with the clicks, we have tried both of of them, and and what we have found is 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 different. Um, so open source map usually uh, we don't know yet if they underestimate deforestation or if machine learning overestimate deforestation, but definitely the the precision of them vary. And and for us, it's important to use both layers of analysis in order to have a better understanding of those farms that have been deforested or they have renovations or they practice agroforestry. Because what is deforestation is tough to, to assess. There is a, a statement in the UDR in the 42 pages, but deforestation in practice looks different in every farm. You can log for wood, to, to ignite your fireplace, or you can log because yeah, you're deforesting and you want to sell wood, but maybe you are logging, you are managing the shade as an agroforestry system. So all of those things have to be taken into account depending of the producer farmer baseline that you have as an exporter. So once you have done your risk assessment, it comes the, the second part of the risk assessment with the, which is assessing the legal production of them. And, and legal production of them is usually not being done by maps, but it's some, some work that you have to be done on the ground and you have to get to know your producers. Um, and as Rubens was saying, it's not only about the maps, but then you have to carry in surveys. You have to uh, gather secondary data on those communities that back up and it's juxtaposed there, uh, but you have to, uh, have a producer's letter of assurance, which is what Alex was, was saying as the supplier code of conduct. And then we visit also supplier farm visits so, so that we understand that, I know that it's hard to see child labor when a technical assistance team is visiting the farm, but the more you visit, the more you get to know these risks that happen at the farm. And, and for Caravela, by working closely together with producers allows us to better understand if those farms have those legal problems more than the deforestation or not. Our technical assistance and quality teams come from the same communities. Half of, of Caravela's workforce come from the communities where we source coffee. So when you are from that community and you see child labor, if you see uh, immigration, um, exploitation, then the, our first filter is our main team stating, I saw this, this, producer is not compliant. Once you do the risk assessment A and B, that is deforestation and legal coffee production, you can go to determining the risk. And determining the risk is that is sole responsibility of the importer. Now, it's done by a, a collaboration with the exporters, and it's done on available information, the ground truth validation, and the case-to-case -case basis. So it can go from zero, too high, but there is a gray area in the regulation that states that it could be negligible. And negligible is determined by the importer. So depending on your supply chain, and as Matthew was saying, the definition of risk varies on the operator. Once you determine the risk, then you have to submit your, uh, you, you mitigate and remediate. We do this by different ways. The first thing is to feedback the producer on the result of the deforestation or legal assessment. Uh, if they have deforested or not, then what we do is that we raise awareness on green asset management, how to carry on good agroforestry practices, logging, uh, shape management. Then we enter in a forest inventory conservation. We, as we measure the forest inventory of the farms we work with. Uh, there is a producer measuring the the DLP diameter at, at breast height of the tree, so we know which species and the their state of the trees. 
And then we have agroforestation and agroforestry initiatives with those producers that have been marked as red, um, that we uh, lend, uh, we provide them and support them with trees that they can plant uh, in their farms as well. One of our partners has planted yeah, 7,000 trees, the, the SCA. And then once you have done that, you need to ensure in the due diligence that your systems, once you have determined the risk, you must prove that that risk that you have determined is not going to be diluted or mixed or blended, as we say it in coffee, with farms yeah. that have risk. So your systems of milling, processing, exporting, transporting must be robust, systemic, and not to make it as possible so that you ensure that farms or coffee coming from farms that are not compliant does not blend with farms that are compliant. Once you have ensured that, you are able to, as, as uh, Rubens was saying, present your due diligence process, summary of information requirements, if your products are not related with deforestation and if they are grown uh, in accordance to relevant legislation. And, and last but not least, again, the communication and reporting. It is stated that there is a mandatory annual reporting to all stakeholders ensuring that they are fully informed of the processes, practices, and areas uh, where action is needed. It could be done as impact reports, or it could be done with uh, communities through uh, producer community reports or, or events, et cetera, et cetera. Usually, and this is the case of Carabela, we, we are our only exporter and importer, so the data that we collect from all producers we collected is homogenized in the seven origins we work with, and it is exported in the same in the same format to our importing offices and then uh, uh, passed on to roaster partners. Uh, if they are outside the EU and need, they need to import coffee to the EU, they become the operator. So we pass this data for them to uh, register the due diligence process. Now, this is an example of our supply chain in Carabela, maybe some uh, big farms that have the ability also to export their coffee, uh, but it's even though it's seen in the coffee industry is not widely seen. Usually uh, coffee supply chains are longer, are more intricate, more complex. And in the next slide and, and answering one of the questions in the chat, if, if you are one exporter from many other exporters in that supply chain, then you need to homogenize, you need to work with your importer to homogenize the data uh, from the different cooperatives that that you're sourcing from and then work with those cooperatives so that they have an homogeneous data package from the producers they, they are buying from. And the idea is that uh, all those players, as uh, Alex was saying, from the importer's directive or, or pushing, they are able to homogenize the data throughout the supply chain, even if there is a cooperative, different buyers, independent buyers, exporters. So. Uh, even if you are exporter and you're buying from another your coffee buyer, the coffee from the farms, you need to work along with them to homogenize the data. So the most important thing here is, and I will double click on that first um, a statement of Matthew, this is a supply chain responsibility, what everybody has to do their part in order for the importer to be compliant at the end of the chain. A couple of things. That, um, and in, in the air, the UDR should not imply higher costs for coffee producers. The sole responsible of the operation is the importer, and then costs should be divided from exporters, uh, cooperatives, etc. But there's you you shouldn't we shouldn't charge the burden of the regulations to the producers. They already have a lot of burden and they do not need to collect the data if you, they have fully support and, and robust support. Uh, it would be tough to match productivity estimates with actual, actual regional farm experts. Uh, there might be, we don't know now with yesterday's news, but they might be a November 24th grade nine product tsunami, what they call maybe a line of containers coming from, from Andrep to Cartagena or from Andrep to 
to uh, ports, main ports in Africa, because all the import experts will be willing to import that coffee or other products before the EU gets into action. And that takes in, into question the, the, the install capacity and reporting systems if they are ready from the EU. We don't have yet, there's a, a, a homework still left to be done on the platform or to submit the data. And, and all of this is important because the future of transparency and traceability, the meaning of it is at stake. If we are not able to comply with the regulations as they are, then at the end of the game, transparency and traceability meaning would be diluted. And diluted, I mean by coffee, Europeans will be drinking the same coffee, even if there is deforestation free or not. And the last point there is full alignment with, with the Sustainable Development Goal 12 is missing. That goal states responsible production and consumption, but these regulations are only focusing in the responsible production. And there is a lot of work being left to be done on how to raise awareness in consumer countries on responsible production, on why coffee should cost more than what it costs. If producers were paid double the price for the coffee they produce, maybe they wouldn't be deforesting double of the farms they have. To. Because when the producer is deforesting, it's not because they hate nature or they have something against Mother Nature and La Pachamama, but rather because they are in the need of fulfilling a living income, a living wage, and a fair price for that coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro. That was a very clear uh, presentation. Um, now, I would like to go to the next speaker, which is uh, Giuseppe from uh, Baiko. Um, Joseph, can you please take the floor and explain us about the steps that exporters take and the challenges and opportunities they uh, they face? Yes, Charling. Hello, thank you. Um, let me make sure that the presentation is start. Yes, I think you should see the presentation starting right now, okay? Yeah, we see it. Perfect, thank you very much. Well, first of all, hello everybody. Let me start with uh, uh, a bit of transparency from our side. Uh, as I said, I work for Progresso and Progresso is a foundation that uh, helps cooperatives across the cocoa and coffee supply chain uh, to uh, have better access to finance. And Progresso has developed Baco, which is uh, uh, a digital solution offering data collection capab capabilities and supply chain tracing uh, for cooperatives in our sectors, coffee and cocoa, uh, and therefore is one of the tools uh, that can be used for uh, UDR compliance. Um, but in this webinar, I'm representing Global Cafes, which is a non-profit organization based in Colombia, specifically in Huila. Uh, and Global Cafe is helping and organizing farmers and cooperatives uh, in order to export high quality and sustainable coffee uh, to the world chain. Uh, so Global Cafe is part of our technical assistance uh, programs. So they are partner of Progresso and of course they use, among other systems, they use Baco for uh, UDR compliance and as we'll see for more. So uh, through this presentation, I'm going to uh, tell you the story of how global, what Global Cafe does in order to prepare uh, and to uh, add data to their, uh, to their product. Um, so let's start with uh, some key elements. There are uh, Global Cafe works with both cooperatives and uh, individual farmers. Uh, and has been working hard, like many other exporters across the globe, uh, to prepare for UDR. Uh, and the start of the work is collection of data uh, at farm level. Uh, this happens directly, uh, going directly with their team to collect data, but can also happen through cooperatives. So uh, also what Pedro was mentioning earlier, homogenization of data is one of the first elements when you do data collection. 
uh, the, of course, the importance of the data to be collected is uh, to keep track of where uh, the coffee comes from and to make sure that it's compliant with any set of regulation, UDR being an example, but you could uh, think about any other uh, set of regulation that might be relevant in the case. Um, Global Cafe works with about 600 farms, some of them organized in cooperatives, as I mentioned before. Uh, and some of the clients uh, that purchase from Global Cafe provide the standards. Um, so in that case, uh, the tools might be proprietary from the importer or from the buyer or from the trader that will purchase the coffee from Global Cafe. Um, the, some of the tools allow also or provide also the um, the uh, element that allow uh, for the deforestation uh, mapping. So in that case, of course, uh, the importer makes the life of an exporter much easier uh, because Global Cafe can use these tools in order to check their data and check the compliance of their producer. Um, the problem in this case is that mostly these tools have an exclusivity. So they might be used only of course for uh, the set or the subset of producers which will eventually uh, uh, be you know the coffee which will be sold only to uh, uh, the specific uh, buyer um, so the uh, data information and data collection is only the first step uh, the important work, uh, the most important part is uh, monitoring uh, of producer, but even more risk assessment. So gathering information of the farmer, uh, at the moment, the one that uh, uh, are falling under the EDR uh, regulation, so that of the producer that will, the, 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 the coffee which is going to travel to Europe is about 200. So uh, we are talking about a third of the total supply chain. Uh, so, of course, uh, Global Cafe started with those. And for these 200 farmers, uh, their the, 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 the coordinates have been collected. Uh, of course, as we have seen before, the GeoJSON uh, points uh, and polygons, of course, uh, the farm identification tool, uh, all of this, all the mandatory data. Uh, and um, this data at the moment that is uh, integrated with the other point of information, all the uh, non-mandatory ones, uh, allows to uh, fill in a matrix, a risk assessment matrix, uh, which will uh, generate uh, scores uh, and allows Global Cafe to uh, identify the highest, the potential highest risk. Um, in the first round of analysis, out of these 200 producer, uh, they have identified 90% of their producer as compliant uh, with UDR standard, so low risk. The remaining 10% uh, have shown some degree of risk, so red or yellow, and uh, uh, these are triggered field activities because, like what Pedro said earlier, uh, there is a very important part which is follow up of the data not just to rely on the data alone but then follow up with monitoring of the producer uh, this monitoring has uh, re further reduced the sample of the high risk um, so of the 30 uh, producer which were in a medium to high risk factor uh, only one was uh, after the follow-up and after the monitoring, it was actually shown to be uh, involved in deforestation activities. And obviously, the fact that the traceability was uh, kept integrated and intact allowed to exclude this producer from the compliant uh, group. So indeed, uh, having traceability data that matches the physical traceability of the product is essential in order to make sure that you can segregate potential um, uh, producer that are in breach. Nevertheless, uh, there is still a follow-up even on this producer and there is an action plan joint developedly uh, with the, the farmer. 
the implementation of which is, is continuously monitored uh, in order to uh, remediate and create a reforestation area, environmental awareness, and ensuring a long-term monitoring. Technology is essential in this process. Uh, so BACO is a good example of a tool that allows, uh, that allows to comply and to generate the data that then can be analyzed. Uh, the BACO app uh, is, uh, allows, allows to uh, collect the data uh, such as, such as uh, polygons, but also a whole lot of other data, including uh, farmer ID, uh, including any potential data point uh, that might be relevant for uh, other uh, standard and other certification in a way that you can integrate in an internal inspector. Um, and of course, to generate the data uh, that will then be uh, the base for your analysis. What we uh, recommend every time that we uh, that, that that some partners start to use our tools is uh, not to focus on the specific baseline of compliance with the regulation. So, for instance, for a small producer, as we said before, uh, one GPS point is in theory enough below the four hectares. Uh, but we do recommend to uh, from the beginning, integrate into the inspection rounds and collect the full data, including the polygons, because there is a lot of value added in with the analytical capacity that UDR uh, makes necessary. Um, by no mean, uh, of course, Baco is not the only option in the market. Uh, I can name uh, several one. Um, origin, fair food, farm force, cropster, uh, such many more. Uh, and in many cases, for an exporter, a combination of the solution is, uh, is, is the right choice because, for instance, uh, BACO is focused on uh, cooperatives, especially uh, small and mid sized cooperatives, which are uh, one of the weakest link in this. and maybe sometimes difficult to reach with other tools so it might be uh, a combination of tool might be your best way forward uh, this is an example of the uh, gps point and the geojson polygons that a uh, single producer have uh, traced uh, for their lot so this could be something uh, these are actual farm lot of global cafe producers um, and you can see how the data can be then uh, easily shared and analyzed, and then of course homogenized uh, to meet any other platform. Uh, of course, this is not an easy process. Um, it's easier to work uh, in the experience of Global Cafe. is easier to work with cooperatives because there is an integration and there is inspection, uh, but individual producer might be more resistant. Um, to receive inspection or uh, to allow visit, uh, to allow monitoring, and they might not fully understand the importance. Uh, to reach better these producers and to uh, um, actually engage and uh, break the circle of hesitance, uh, training is extremely important. Uh, education and training is extremely important and also represents a strong opportunity. Uh, in the case of Global Cafe, uh, the training session focused on a program uh, of transition towards agroecological farming, uh, raising awareness of envir environmental topic and promoting uh, uh, green practices in general for the farm. Uh, all these activities actually create an opportunity. Uh, create the opportunity to improve the understanding of producer and farm location. Um, to disseminate farming practices, which actually strengthen in reality the sustainability, which is the ultimate goal of most of the standards, and enhance uh, not, uh, like so, uh, sensibly the reputation of Global Cafe and the producer as a partner, a uh, trustworthy partner for the buyers. And as we discussed before, the fact that uh, some buyers are uh, relaying on the work of Global Cafe 
uh, to uh, strengthen their supply chain so much that they are willing to pay for tools for them is only because of the reputation that Global Cafe has been able to create uh, and maintain. So this is uh, actually a process that might uh, and will create new business opportunity and stronger uh, client relationship. Um, the conclusion to wrap up uh, the approach of Global Cafe, is, uh, we find that is a very good example of how uh, the UDR in general and in any sustainability standard uh, as a whole are not just about meeting regulation. Uh, the important is showing the commitment uh, to sustainable and responsible sourcing and to sustainable pra practices at producer level and uh, investing in it allows you to stay ahead of the curve positioning yourself as a leader in your coffee in the coffee industry and in your community and uh, we are very excited to see and continue to to follow how their efforts will grow and will uh, and our uh, global cafe as one of many uh, um, of the of the best in class organization are uh, going to grow further through this effort and through this investment. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Giuseppe, uh, for that uh, very interesting uh, um, uh, content. And also great to have some, uh, some uh, uh, information from the exporter perspective. Uh, now we are closing, at, we're almost uh, closing off. We are uh, close to the end of this webinar. Uh, but we do have uh, quite some questions. Um, I, I'm afraid that we don't have uh, time to answer all of your questions. But Hans, could you please take the floor and uh, and answer a few of our, uh, our questions? Yes, sure, definitely. Um, there are a lot of questions, but I'll just, uh, just because of time, I'll just select a few. Um, I have a question from Sagita. Uh, if I am an exporter from a non-EU region and I, I am purchasing products from supplier who has bulk stock of that product from many farmers, so as an exporter or trader, how can I manage to have traceability, sustainability certifications to follow EU DR compliance? Um, Ruben, can you maybe answer this question? Sure, yes, thank you for the question. Um, Pedro answered it a little bit maybe already as well. Um, if it's about the, the coffee that you're buying from your suppliers, uh, this, um, if it enters the E, if it is shipped to the EU, then it needs to be ER, EU DR compliant. So that's maybe really difficult to achieve, but it is what needs to be done. Um, so the suppliers would need to give you this, uh, this data that you need. Um, I want to just highlight two maybe elements of this question that you're referring to. So if it's for a bulk from many farmers, it's okay to, to combine these shipments from multiple farmers or cooperatives. You just need to have uh, geolocations for all of the farmers that produce the coffee that you're buying. And if any of these uh, data points or geolocations is non-compliant, then the, all of the coffee becomes non-compliant, very uh, simply put. So, it's possible to combine, you just need to have traceability and uh, the geolocation in place. You also mentioned certification and certification can support, um, but there you also need, um, for example, with Rainforest Alliance, it needs to be uh, fully traceable identity preserved and the producers also, also needs to be compliant with a few extra requirements. So they have to have been audited against those uh, as well. And then, um, it can support with EUDR compliance, but not replace it, uh, of course. So I hope that somewhat answers your question, uh, and thank you again. Okay, thank you, Ruben. Um, then I'll ask another question, uh, which is, what is the definition of a trader, or how broad is this? If you buy pro uh, processed food with coffee ingredients produced by a factory or supplier, uh, or supply this to a retailer. This is actually a trader, but what does it mean for compliance? What do you need to comply with in terms of the EUDR? Uh, Mathieu, could you maybe answer this question, please? Yes, absolutely. Thank you uh, for the question. So 
first starting by explaining the art, those definitions of who is a trader, who is an operator, those are very important definitions in the regulation. The operator is the first company that places the product on the market and the trader is the one that buys something that is already on the market and sells it without transformation to another one. So for instance, you are importing coffee from Kenya, you are the importer, you are the operator as per the EUDR definition. Then as an operator, you are selling the coffee to someone else, making roasting, and then finally it ends up on a retailer uh, shelf. The retailer is only a trader. It hasn't imported the coffee. It is just selling it and putting it on the market. Now, when it comes to composite products, you mentioned about that. So you have, imagine uh, ice cream, coffee ice cream. Well, coffee is part of the ice cream, but when it comes to being subject to the EUDR or not, you need to look at the annex one of the regulation that is the full list of the products that are subject to the EUDR. Ice cream is not in the list. So even if it is chocolate ice cream, coffee ice cream, you do not need to comply with the EUDR at that stage. But if you are selling coffee capsules, uh, coffee pads for your coffee machine, then yes, because those are the coffee products listed in the Annex 1. So remember, the operator is the one that needs to do the whole due diligence because they are the first company to place the product on the EU market, like this EU importer from Kenya. But the trader, those agents on the market that are selling the product to each other until it reaches the final consumer, those are the traders. And the traders, they can rely on the due diligence process done by the operators they can actually rely on the due diligence statements by, made by the others. And depending on the scale of the trader, large retailer or small coffee gourmet type shop, if it is a small company, the trader actually only needs to know that the coffee is coming from this importer, traceability, name of supplier, that's it. If you're the big retailer and you're just a trader placing the product on the market, what you need to know is, of course, who is your supplier that has imported the coffee, and then you also need to do some due diligence elements. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Um, another common question that we received was about the ITC handbook, and this will be uh, sent to you uh, after this webinar. Um, and for those who also asked uh, very interesting questions, we don't have time to answer all the questions. But what we can do is uh, we have on our website on cbi.eu, uh, we have um, um, a link where you can also uh, place your question there and we will answer your question um, in the coming days. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hans, for uh, arranging this and thank you to our uh, speakers for answering the questions, of course. Uh, now we are close, very close to the end. I would like to end with some uh, very, very important but final recommendations. Uh, Hans, please, first to you. What would be your recommendation, final recommendation to our audience? Yes, thank you, Charling. Um, I would like to share my screen. My recommendation would be to uh, find um, these insightful studies that we have published, also uh, written, some written by Charling and Rubin about the EUDR. I'll let you share my screen so that you, I can show you how I go about. Um, can you see my screen now, Charling? Yeah, very well. Yeah. Okay, so this is the website of CBI, cbi.eu. And on the, on the bottom here, you see market information. Uh, if you scroll a little bit down, you see the sectors that we are uh, working in, and one of them is coffee. If you click on the coffee and you scroll a little bit down, you see the studies that we have published, which are most uh, very recently, about coffee. Um, so we have different types of, of uh, coffee products. We also have interest in export markets, which are mostly European markets. And we also have uh, published a study about EUDR, which was on sustainability and social responsibility. So tips to become EUDR compliant. If you click on this link, it will bring you to the study. Um, and you can also download it on the right side by clicking download the study. And, uh, you download it in PDF style. So it contains a lot of information and also about free tools 
on, on how to do your geo uh, data. So please take your time and go through it. And if there are any questions, you can still ask us through our uh, ask a question button here. So that's the advice I will give uh, all that in today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hans. Now we are really at the end of the of the webinar. Uh, I would like to invite everybody, all the speakers, to uh, turn on your camera for some uh, final recommendations. Um, well, let's start with you, uh, uh, Ruben. What would be your final recommendation? Thanks, Chelling. My final recommendation would be to discuss the EUDR with your buyers ask them which information they need and what kind of assurance they want. So work with them to make sure that you can help them comply with the UDR. Yeah, Thanks. that really makes sense. How about you, Mathieu? What would be your final recommendation? Well, keep track with the, the news and the potential extension of the next 12 months uh, for additional time to prepare. Definitely keep track with the news, um, read the study from CBI, read the handbooks from ITC, get back to us if you have questions. Great, Alex. Uh, yeah, I'm also going to kind of um, echo Rubens, uh, but also say start working now already on your transparency and traceability systems because we're talking EUDR now, but there's only going to be more and more legislations like these coming in it. It really doesn't harm. Um, it's always good to be prepared and don't panic. It's okay. You can always ask for help. <laughs> Pedro, please follow up. Yeah, one definitely, definitely do, do not panic. Uh, this, these practices might seem tough, but they are fair. The, 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 that's the way we should all be going. Transparency only brings good things. And take the lead. Take the lead on your supply chain. If you are an exporter in a multiple layer supply chain, take the lead. Don't, don't, be, don't be the one that is at the end of, of submitting the data that will call that will cause reprocesses. If you are the lead exported of that supply chain, you can work in partnership with that importer and you won't suffer uh, reprocesses when taking the data. If you are the last one to provide, you most probably are going to reprocess the data. So take the lead, don't panic as Alex said, and, and just move forward with it because traceability and transparency just bring good things. Yeah, it really makes sense. How about you, Giuseppe? Do you have one final recommendation? Yes, I think that uh, preparing for UDR is uh, like requires collecting data, validating data, analyzing, interpreting, and all of this comes at a significant investment, both in uh, resources and in management attention. And, uh, you know, it costs a lot of time and effort and probably monetary investment to an organization. At the same time, it's really an invaluable source uh, of data for. Uh, uh, information for decision making and it's eventually a strong competitive advantage for the one do, doing it well so I think it's really important to take it seriously and not just limit oneself to the basic and try to do it as, bet, as best as possible and integrate it in your baseline system Thank you very much, uh, Giuseppe. Thank you all, and thank you to our audience. It was uh, great to have uh, to, to be that we could organize this uh, webinar, and I'm very grateful that all of you attended. So thanks for your attention, and hopefully till uh, next time. Bye bye.